participants of the citizenship and statelessness clinic. And I can see that we also have a few guests from outside. Of course, we have Bhavani who has been joining our sessions. Uh, but apart from her, there are other colleagues also who are in the room. Uh, so maybe we'll first start with the housekeeping rules and then I will introduce the clinic to Manav and Manav to everybody else. Right. Thank you, Mohsen. Yeah, and so a couple of things. Please this, keep your. Just one small thing. We are recording the session. Uh, so this is for the uh, benefit of everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Please keep your mic and uh, hopefully cameras off as well. You can switch on your cameras if you want. I mean, we recommend that to our clinic students anyway. Keep, keep your microphones off uh, until the Q&A session and then please raise your hand to ask the question and we'll then say your name and you request it to unmute and, and ask a question. You can otherwise type in the chat box as well. And if there are any questions during the session, we'll sure be um, um, reading out those to Manav. And uh, yeah, I think the rest of uh, everything else is quite straightforward and uh, we look forward to a very engaging discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Manav, would you, would you like me to just say a couple of words uh, to welcome you first? I'm, I'm sure there are many of us who already know you. Uh, Manav is currently doing his uh, uh, PhD in history at Princeton and he is finally pursuing what he's actually been working on and thinking about for a very long time, uh, which is uh, the law, politics, and history of uh, partition. Uh, and one of the great things about Manav's work is his great uh, familiarity with the language and cultures, both on the Eastern and the Western front, so to speak. Uh, so we are really looking forward in the coming many months and a few years to see some exceptional work innovative and refreshing work on partition histories. And as we know, uh, one of the key themes of uh, partition uh, is citizenship and the refugee crisis and migration. And that is uh, one of the key areas of uh, research, study and interest of uh, Manav. Uh, also, um, Manav has had a, a deep relationship with Jindal. He, if I'm not wrong, started his teaching and academic career over here because he has taught at other places as well. Uh, so we're very happy to welcome you back, Manav, obviously in, in a very different format uh, on Microsoft Teams, not unfortunately in these conditions physically to welcome you. Um, just a quick word about the clinic. Um, so this is meant to be a year long clinic focusing on citizenship and statelessness issues specifically in India uh, and our broad focus is not only on questions of human rights or citizenship law in India. We are also hoping to intervene in some of the debates around possibilities of statelessness uh, in, in the context of some of the current things which are happening. And we are introducing our students and participants to these legal debates, both in Indian and international law, in the hope that we will be able to contribute uh, to these contemporary developments. Um, and one of the important modules which uh, we are meant to discuss is uh, obviously the citizenship regime under Indian law uh, and also its historical and political antecedents. Uh, and so we are quite quite happy to and quite fortunate to uh, receive Manal, who is obviously an expert in the area. And we would love to hear particularly from him as he has agreed to introduce the broad themes of the academic debate, how they have evolved and to connect them to what we are seeing in contemporary times in the politics of citizenship uh, and citizenship law uh, in India. Great. So uh, on to you, Manav. We'll feel free to speak as long as you want. We have a two hour session, though we have given a ballpark figure of say around an hour uh, for your talk and for question answers, but feel free to extend that. Uh, hopefully our guests would have time to stick around uh, for the whole session. Great. Okay. Thanks, Mohsen and Ashish for this opportunity and hello to everybody else. Um, yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting to be back in a way to Jindal because I I was I was teaching over here from 2015 to 16, and I actually my first class in Jindal was on citizenship. I was teaching constitutional law, so it's kind of back to uh, where I started. So um, in the course of today's discussion, I thought we we're going to talk about uh, citizenship and the partition. 
and uh, what i also want to look at is the and it's kind of interesting because it's very because many of these debates are very similar to debates that have come up over the last year or so particularly with regard to the ca so and and i think that what i've been thinking about over the last few weeks is that much is well much has been made about how the caa marks in a sense a break with the with the liberal conception of citizenship in india and how it's explicit privileging of as far as i remember hindu sikh buddhist jain parsi or christian persons from pakistan afghanistan or bangladesh is a, is seen as a, as a complete break from the earlier uh, regime i don't really think that's actually true i think that i, I mean while that's this is definitely not a defense of the ca but but it's it's kind of interesting to see how even and partly because of the partition these issues came up at the very outset of the setting of the terms of citizenship uh so i I've, i've made a presentation which is uh a pretty um a, a complicated endeavor for me and not created technology so i'm going to try to see if we can uh, share that share it see and yeah oh wow there we are so i will do second so Okay. So, um, right. So uh, today, I'm going to look at. I'm going to start off by talking about two distinct questions, which is, which is looking at first the degree to which partition citizenship implicates both in the popular imagination and in the legal categories, and how this ended up becoming a South Asian problem. So, what's what's interesting also is that that Indian debates and Pakistani debates are supposed to be very different, but if you've read the readings that I assigned. you see that that was entirely what was happening and then how indian citizenship provisions really went from being this very simple thing at the very beginning of the constitution which was kind of discussed in march 1947 and then left aside for a while so it was seen as something pretty uncomplicated and and now it's become something that's received far more attention than any other provision in the constitution by by the time the debate ends and ambedkar actually goes on to call it a headache can you see the presentation if you want hello yeah we yeah. can okay great right and if anyone has a question or something just uh, i mean don't mind uh, don't don't hesitate to just cut in right so um now um basically what had happened after independence was that uh, you know like the what what we need to kind of remember is that the whole uh, that post colonial south asia had changed so much from what it was even 6 months before independence that you couldn't actually assume categories of citizenship for populations but this was actually something that was uh, produced a produced category that was debated and given sanction both from the top up and the bottom so it it was a long term project uh, aimed at turning subjects into citizens and the and that popul and both populations both majority and minority populations were active participants in this process now if i mean if we go to sirvai which is one of the basic text of uh, canonical text of in constitutional law uh, he says that uh, citizenship ha- is a triangular relationship it's a personal bond between states and citizens whereby citizens bear allegiance to the state and in terms are given full political and uh, and other rights um now um if as you've gone through the readings you'll probably have seen that there were two models of citizenship that were talked about one is the idea of jus soli which is the right of soil which means that anybody who is born in a particular territory has the right to be a citizen of that particular territory and uh, the second one is jus sanguinis which is linked to questions of nationality and ethnicity which uh, comes from the latin for the right to blood uh, the right to blood where ethnicity and parentage is key now um, both uh, jayal and chatterji when they're talking about citizenship in india say that citizenship actually starts off by uh, looking at uh, 
as I mean, the idea of citizenship in India starts off as a as a youth solai thing. So if you look at the first uh, draft of the citizenship uh, provisions in the constitution, and interestingly, the first draft was in the fundamental rights section. They didn't even think that it was necessary to have a separate chapter on citizenship. Uh, this is April 23rd, 1947. Within six months, they'll know that this is that that this is not going to be as simple as they think it is. Um, so every person born in the union or naturalized according to its law and subject to the jurisdiction thereof was supposed to be a citizen of the union. So this is basically use solai simpliciter. Uh, of course, when this was being talked about, this was tempered with questions of uh, with some elements of use sanguinis because uh, there was this question of what happens to people who are born in India but don't really uh, have families that live in India, and the, and the converse, what happens to people whose families live abroad but are actually domiciled in India. So, so then uh, domicile came up, and then uh, what is now Article 5 of the Constitution was uh, was kind of was drafted at about this time. So Article 5 of the Constitution actually says that at the commencement of the Constitution, every person who has his domicile in the territory of India uh, and who was born in the territory of India or either whose parents were born in the territory of India or who has been ordinarily resident in the territory of India for not less than five years, immediately preceding such commencement, shall be a citizen of India. So, I mean, when we look at this, this is pretty uh, simple, but of course, this doesn't really think about what the partition is going to do to uh, this, this entire question. Mm. Now, domicile, of course, uh, just a small note on what domicile is. Domicile is basically uh, defined as a place where the habitation of a person has been fixed and from where there's no intention of moving there from. The reason I'm, I'm specifically mentioning what um, uh, domicile is, is because domicile also becomes relevant in the context of the partition. And we're going to see that particularly in the context of women and uh, their citizenship. Now, um, this, as Joya Chatterjee points out, this, is also, this was also useful because given that the constitution was being drafted contemporaneously with partition and independence, both India and Pakistan, according to her, thought of a use solai based conception of citizenship, which is primarily territory. So where you are born, you're the citizen of that country. Uh, the after partition happens, the other country really has no role to play in uh, in, in deciding uh, your rights or lack thereof. Um, but of course, this uh, was predicated on the assumption, which later turned out to be erroneous, that uh, partition would not result in large scale migrations. And, and interestingly, this idea that partition would not lead to large scale migrations persists through June, July and August 1947. In June 1947, for example, there's uh, a story about how Jinnah was, uh, Jinnah met a set of prominent Muslim leaguers from Delhi and said that, well, Delhi is, if Delhi isn't part of Pakistan, which also wasn't clear at the time because because the Punjab was to be divided and, and uh, Delhi was at the borders of the Punjab, then, uh, well, you're Indian citizens and that's the end of it. Um, now, um, in order to understand citizenship, I think we have to take the idea of what uh, Wazira Zamindar calls the long partition somewhat seriously. The long partition has, according to her, been defined as the way in which two post-colonial states, basically India and Pakistan, comprehended, intervened and shaped the colossal displacements of partition. And in doing so, recalibrated and remolded the idea of citizen, state, nation and territory. All of this seemed clear to, I mean, like all these categories seemed clear in March 1947. All of this was changed by September 1947. Now, um, this basically uh, resulted in the in, in mass migrations that first that started in 1947, but continued until at least the 1960s on both flanks of the border. Uh, 
on the eastern flank which is the the bengal assam the west bengal assam and east bengal border and the western border which stretches all the way from kashmir up to uh, gujarat and sind now uh, so there's also a note of terminological uh, caution i want to make over here because uh, the terms that were used were refugee and migrant but the idea of a refugee has to be distinguished from what we understand a refugee now as a stateless person uh, at this point of time the term refugee in india referred to those who were who moved from to india from pakistan and a migrant was seen as somebody who moved from india to pakistan now importantly these these they were called refugees but they weren't really refugees in the sense of stateless people they definitely had a state allegiance which was uh, also seen as uh, i mean they definitely had a state allegiance and that state allegiance was acknowledged by the state they were moving to it was just that their domicile and their uh, and their the and and the state that they wanted to be part of did not at that particular point intersect um two dates are very significant first of um, in march 1947 and the 19th of august uh, 19th of july sorry not august 1948 uh, and and i'm going to and and we will see this when we discuss articles 6 and 7 of the constitution uh the first of march is a significant date because it was the 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 cut off date for partition violence also also the indian government uh, also the constitution assembly thought because uh violence started in rawalpindi on the 3rd of march and and continued in punjab throughout this time and because the eastern border wasn't considered because uh as we will see in the course of this discussion the eastern border is peripheral to questions of citizenship in the way that were fundamental to the way to the determination of citizenship law at the time that the constitution was being drafted so the violence of direct action day on nawakhali and such did not feature um okay so article 6 is uh something that we should spend a little bit of time on because it talks about the rights of citizenship of certain persons who have migrated from india to pakistan there's a non obstante clause at the beginning not with sending anything contained in article 5 which is all about which is basically a use so like conception of citizenship with a little bit of you saying business which is about parents but this is a departure from that so a person who has migrated to the territory of india from the territory now included in pakistan shall be deemed to be a citizen of india if he and either of his parents or any of his grandparents were born in india as defined in the government of india act of 1935 and 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 this even even this little bit about the government of india act is significant because before the government of india act the india included burma and eden so both of them were excised from the idea of india and and that was particularly significant because burma had a huge population of indians and and joy chatterjee just talk uh, does talk about that in in her uh, in questions around indian nationals versus citizens and um in the case where such person has so migrated before the 19th of july 1948 he shall ordinarily be resident he has been and has been ordinarily resident in the territory of india since the date of his migration or in the event that a person has migrated on or after the 19th of july 1948 he has been registered as a citizen of india by an officer appointed on that behalf by the government of the dominion of india on an application now um we will uh now talk about what the significance of the 19th of july 1948 is but the important thing to note over here is that the very uh that, that this is about 11 months after partition and uh the very fact that the government decided to use this date meant that they thought that partition migration had more or less in the ordinary course of events ended the except uh migration after the 19th of july was seen as exceptional and and this was uh, and this was only true for the western frontier and particularly and only for the states uh, for the provinces of west punjab and um, the northwest frontier province hindus from sindh continued to move to india until the 50s 
and also from Baluchistan. But anyway, um, I think we should talk about Article 7 as well, which is another um, exception to the rule of uh, the, the use of that conception, which is, uh, and, and this is the most controversial clause. Uh, it was called the obnoxious clause by its detractors. It was called obligatory by those who supported it. And, and it's interesting that even though religion is not explicitly mentioned, debates around both Article 6 and Article 7 make it very clear who is contemplated under these provisions and who isn't. And that is largely based on religion. And, um, and that religion... And, and, and in that category, you see the Muslim as one category and non-Muslims as the other. Um, so, rights of citizenship of certain migrants to Pakistan, notwithstanding anything in Articles 5 and 6, again, another uh, complete non obstante clause, a, a person who has, after the first day of March 1947, so again, like the 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 third of March is when the, is when violence starts in Rawalpindi, and that's assumed to be the beginning of partition violence. Uh, has migrated from the territory of India to the territory now included in Pakistan, shall not be deemed to be a citizen of India, provided that nothing in this article shall apply to a person who, after having so migrated to the territory now included in Pakistan has returned to the territory of India under a permit for resettlement or permanent return issued by or under the authority of any law. And every such person shall be, for the purposes of Clause B of Article 6, be deemed to have migrated to the territory of India after the 19th day of, day of July 1948. Right. So basically, uh, this, this little bit, uh, that the person should have been registered as a citizen of India uh, and the very fact that he's got a permanent a permit of resettlement or permanent return makes him someone who has actually got that, uh, has, has actually ended up uh, being registered as a citizen of India. So at first sight, of course, for somebody who uh, hasn't engaged with the, the debates around it or the case law around it, this, this again doesn't seem like a particularly problematic provision because it of course, it says that if you leave in March 1947, you lose Indian citizenship, but that's fine because you also have a way of getting it back. All you need to do is get a permit for resettlement or permanent return issued by or under the authority of any law. And uh, the law uh, is uh, clear, or so it seems, but it really isn't. And why it isn't is something I'm going to... Um, Start off. Does anyone have any questions so far? Actually, do we want to just go over the sections again? Like, so the use soli, use sanguinis uh, bit is clear, articles five, six, and seven are clear. Right. Now, uh, now let's actually get to the the meat of what the problem was with the way in which these three provisions were crafted. So there are three questions that actually come up. One is the idea of India's perceived uh, sole responsibility for Pakistani Hindus and Sikhs. So the assumption is that, and, and this comes out very clearly in constituent assembly debates across party lines, as Pakistani Hindus and Sikhs don't have any other place in the world to go to but India, right? There is also a related suspicion around Muslim migration into India, both the movement, both the return of people who've gone to Pakistan and the, and the movement of, of other Muslims to India, and we'll discuss that in the context of Assam towards the end. And this is all undergirded by the hard economics of rehabilitation or what I would call the cost of citizenship over here. Now, uh, the question of Hindus and Sikhs is fundamentally Indian was something that arose out of the logic of partition and out of the belief 
among many members of the Indian Constituent Assembly that the partition was not a territorial division, but also an excision of a part of the motherland. So because of that, the idea was that any Hindus and Sikhs in Pakistan, uh, were, which of course at the time also included Bangladesh, were seen as fundamentally the responsibility of India. Uh, P.R. Deshmukh actually uh, very clearly and very strongly articulates this in 1949. And I'm going to read this out actually because I think it's it's something we should think about uh, very carefully when it's very similar to questions that arise now about the CAA. By the mere fact that he is a Hindu or a Sikh, he should get Indian citizenship because it is this one circumstance that makes him disliked by others. So again, the idea that that merely by virtue of being Hindu or Sikh, you are subject to persecution in Pakistan. Uh, but we are the secular state. So again, the assumption that India will not discriminate against its minorities, even though that's why that's that's actually what India is doing. Uh, I do not want to recognize the fact that every Hindu or Sikh in every part of the world should have a home of his own. We are not debarring others from getting citizenship here. We merely say that we have no other country to look to for acquiring citizenship rights. And therefore, we, the Hindus and Sikhs, so long as we follow the respective religions, should have the right of citizenship in India and should be entitled to retain such citizenship so long as we acquire no other. So this is, I mean, so again, like it's very similar to questions around the, the way in which the CAA is thought of right now, right? Like the idea of, of Hindus, or of non-Muslims as being discriminated against in other parts of the subcontinent about the fact that there is no, that, that Indian Muslims are not losing their citizenship. But we need to, we need to nonetheless ensure that, that those who have been excised from our our, our motherland and, and this whole idea of, of this lost limb of the Pakistani Hindus and Sikhs being a lost limb is something that comes up time and again in the constitution. Uh, it's also something that, that Nehru himself uh, mentions in, in, the twist of, in, in his Twist with Destiny speech that we feel for those who have been cut away from us in this uh, unnatural division and we hope and, and we will always have a responsibility for them. Um, but what's but again now what's happening what was happening as Joya Chatterjee points out is that in the period between 1947 to 1950 there was this very very complicated relationship that minorities had with uh, their uh, with the with the governments of the opposite dominion. So I, I, when partition happened in by September 1947. In both dominions, the high commissioners for the other dominion had taken charge of minority refugee camps pending their movement, which again was ensured by military through military evacuations, which were carried out by soldiers of the other dominion itself. Um, one interesting aspect of this is, I mean, one, one interesting fact that emerges from this is that the first Pakistani uh, high commission in India was located in the barracks of the Sher Shah uh, Suri uh, Road uh, mess in the army, which is now the site of the Delhi High Court. So now, of course, it is impossible for the Pakistani citizen to get into any cantonment zone. But because of the way in which uh, partition was seen, because of the responsibility that part that uh, the, that both countries took over for them for the minorities, and because of the military uh, escorts that they had to provide. Pakistan was actually given um, the first Pakistani uh, high commission was actually located within uh, an army mess in India. Um, also, Pakistan, I mean, the Pakistani high commissioner in uh, Delhi and the Indian high commissioner in uh, Karachi were simultaneously, you know, organizing water supply to camps, medicines to camps, uh, food to camps. Like there are these long letters that actually go from the Indian government to the Pakistani High Commissioner in 19, in September 1947 about the fact that the Lal Kila uh, camp only had two functional toilets for 40,000 people. So I mean, so there is actually that sense of responsibility that is that is going on at that particular point of time. This is before, of course, citizenship is debated, but just after partition. Now. Um, 
but interestingly what happens is is that the moment you look at the idea of people moving to pakistan the whole there, there's this whole question about what the scope of partition migration was or what the intent behind partition migration was so in the in the constituent assembly and in a lot of writing around uh, uh, in partition in india you see the idea of muslims moving from india to pakistan as part of a deliberate desire to move so it is a conscious well thought out decision to leave india as jaspat rai kapoor again from up um, but with family who, which had moved from punjab to west punjab to india in 1947 says once a person has migrated to pakistan and transferred his loyalty from india to pakistan his migration is complete he has made up his mind to kick this country and let it go to its own fate and to go to pakistan and make it a prosperous country on the other hand when the question comes about whether about hindus who continue to live in pakistan until the winter of 1947 justice mahajan uh says something completely different so he says that you know in october and november 1947 men's minds were in a state of flux nobody thought when he was leaving india for pakistan or vice versa that he was forever abandoning the place of his ancestors now so which obviously makes sense because in 1947 uh, there was really no clarity on what these migrations meant uh, the only thing that had happened was that the Punj- that in the punjab they had the, both governments had agreed to transfer populations pending a settlement of the situation but again the this the situation was never settled in any way other than a uh, continuous uh, uh, in any way other than people the vast majority of people not being able to come back um and and but this distinction between the idea of muslims going to pakistan as going with with almost with a form of you know malice of forethought versus a uh, people coming into india as as refugees with no other options uh having lost everything persisted uh through the through the course of these debates and 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 is significant in the way in which article 7 both was drafted and operated now the the history behind article 7 and I'll just go back very quickly to article 7 is uh, we we've seen that of course you need a permit for the settlement or permanent return to uh, come back to india and and so it seems pretty straight forward but it really isn't and why and why isn't it is because in early 1948 after gandhi ji's fast in delhi and then his subsequent death and then the government's crackdown on the rss and on uh, anti muslim violence in much of north india a set of uh people who'd gone to pakistan started to come back now the numbers weren't really huge i've i've put in this uh, cid enumeration of muslim of quote and quote muslim movements which actually shows that the total number of people who came back in toto were about 12 to 15000 these numbers are not huge but the the whole the way in which they were seen by the population of delhi by uh, a lot of the government was as this one way traffic that was coming from pakistan taking over um, of people to, trying to come back and take over their houses this almost like almost a medical terminology of this influx of of people moving in of this fear of contamination of infection and this is what led to a permit system being put in place um initially from august 1947 to july 1948 there was no bar on indians moving to pakistan moving to pakistan and vice versa in fact one of the conditions of partition had been that there would be no restriction placed on the idea of people moving to the extent that you know when you that uh, that a lot of that nehru's first visit to pakistan was supposed to be in 1949 but throughout the winter of 1947 nehru was constantly going to uh, lahore for meetings with regard to people who were moving liaquat and jinnah were constantly coming to delhi uh, 
and and that wasn't even considered to be for them travel now this uh, sorry the a permit for permanent resettlement was one of the high, uh, hardest ones to actually get the permit system basically meant uh, allowed uh, permits to be given in three circumstances one for transiting two for visits and for meeting divided families and thirdly a permit for permanent resettlement now this permit for permanent resettlement was almost impossible to get only about 1200 people got it in the year in in the first year of its uh um installation and again uh to get the permit required the a uh, a uh, background check a family check any link with the muslim league before partition could mean that you wouldn't that you wouldn't get a per, that you wouldn't get the permit uh even and also for divided families but even then that was very rare but the the the, the thing isn't what's interesting is not the fact that the permit was given so sparingly but the kind of fears it roused the assumption was that when muslims were coming back to india when people who had already moved to pakistan were coming back to india they were coming back as either as a form of, as a kind of fifth column that was attempting to destroy india from within or coming back to take over their property now why were taking over their property be a problem because of the whole way in which the evacuee property regime had started to function now um evacuee property norms have been in a lot of scholarship described as as brutal laws as exceptional laws as deeply complex laws um what they basically uh and and in fact their complexity comes because they were serving two contradictory purposes now what were these laws now in the weeks after partition in early september 1947 as populations were on the move in punjab both governments basically uh came up with a set of norms by which they would take over the property of those who had left and hold it in trust for them until they came back so the migrants or the people leaving were recognized as the sole owners of property they left behind but in order to protect this property and to prevent it from being alienated un- by unauthorized ways the government would take this over and hold it in trust but there were two or three things that happened at the same time first this was also a harvest season the punjab was a very fertile uh land and uh, and the food supplies of both countries was in a state of flux so refugees needed to be resettled on these lands so re- while refugees were resettled again the whole assumption was that migrants were to continue to be the sole owners of the property but pending their coming back or the settlement of the question of compensation refugees would be allowed to live on these lands this was also happening because a lot of the a lot of refugees again out of desperation on both sides of the border were forcing their way into these houses or on these on this land and joel chatterjee talks about this so evacue property now was serving evacue property law was now serving two contradictory purposes firstly it was attempting to safeguard the property of those that had migrated either until they returned or until an intergovernmental solution could be found india was rooting for an intergovernmental solution pakistan because the volume of property was more in pakistan was rooting for the person to person exchange but simultaneously all of this property had also gone into a compensate compensation pool to rehabilitate refugees who were living on this now especially because in india the amount of property that muslims had left was much lesser than the property hindus and sikhs had left when they came to india uh, it the the whole question of muslims coming back was seen as taking away what the 
already marginalized Hindus and Sikhs who come from Pakistan were going to get. So therefore, it became almost impossible for uh, the government to actually be seen as giving permits to people. Only a few thousand, as I mentioned earlier, were likely to return. And Nehru himself, you know, Nehru, in, when, when this is being debated in the context of Article 7 in the Constitution, Nehru first makes a very strong point about how we cannot discriminate against um, Muslims who have chosen to leave in situations that were not of their volition. But he also says, and, and, this, is, and this is the way in which he tries to assuage these questions of, of the costs of, of Muslims coming back, quote unquote, that only a few thousand are likely to return and that they are ensuring that the procedure for getting the permit has been made exceedingly difficult. Now, because this was made so difficult, and, and not only was it made difficult, after 1951 and the, and the Liyakat Nehru Act, which I will mention in the next few minutes, uh, the, the government actually came up with a law that said, even if people are given perm permits of resettlement, this resettlement will not mean that their property will no longer be evacuated property. So even if they come back, they are not going to get their property back. The property is going to go into this compensation pool until an intergovernmental solution comes up. As it happened, an intergovernmental solution never came up, and the government nationalized this property by 1957 and redistributed it. Um, so, as we can see, I mean, like in, in the, as we can see, what is actually happening in the period between 1947 to 1950 is that the is that the the government of both dominions is taking a very very significant interest in the rights of minorities in both on on both sides. Um, the Liaquat Nehru Pact. And Amit Shah himself, when he spoke about the about the CAA, said that the Liaquat Nehru Pact was an example of this. But actually, the Liaquat Nehru Pact is the point where this starts to break. Uh, contrary to discussions around the CAA that suggest that the Nehru Liaquat Pact situated uh, minority rights as the responsibility of the other dominion, the pact did the opposite. Uh, now, this uh, a, a little bit of background about this pact is also interesting because this pact comes in as a response to violence that happens in Bengal. As I will now mention, uh, throughout this time, there has really been very little that has been happening, very little sustained violence that has happened in Bengal. Uh, in 1948, migration in Bengal slows down. There, there are about 8 lakh people who moved on both sides of the border as opposed to the Western border, where about 75 lakh people have moved and the movement is continuing. In late 1949, however, there is, there is rioting that starts in East Bengal that spreads across East Bengal and then spreads to India as well. Uh, this leads to about a million and a half people moving both ways. And the fears of a migration of the kind that happened in the West are what lead to both Nehru and the Akhat Ali Khan coming together and 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 specifically saying that the respond that the that minority rights are the responsibility of their own governments. The first part, I, I'm going to quote two bits. The governments of India and Pakistan solemnly agree that each shall ensure to the minorities throughout their territory complete equality of citizenship, irrespective of religion full security in respect of life, culture, property, and personal honor. Both governments wish to emphasize that the allegiance and loyalty of the minorities is to the states of which they are, sorry, of which they are citizens, and it is to the government of their own states that they should look for the redress of their grievances. Um, now, on the Eastern frontier, as I mentioned, my, all the, the bulk of migration happens after those 1947-48 cutoff dates. Migra migration starts before, it starts in 1946. Uh, there's some that happens in 47, the situation stabilizes by late 48. And then early 1950, all of this starts again. Um, now, again, 
economics is not as relevant over here because since there was no exchange of populations, evacuee property norms in Bengal were very different from evacuee property norms in the rest of the country. Evacuee property in Bengal continued to be property held by held in trust by the state for migrants who were presumed to return. This was not distributed to refugees. And the permit system, interestingly, and I mentioned this at the beginning, but I will I will reiterate this. The permit system did not apply in the East. The free movement of minorities was supposed to ensure a feeling of security, which would translate into persons moving across the border. And as a result of that, uh, there was you could you could cross the border without a permit. Uh, the very nature of the border also, uh, because there were because it wasn't even properly demarcated, meant that there was little policing of migrants. But even in Bengal, and particularly in Assam, you see this refugee migrant difference coming up in the context of. Um, I'm very briefly going to talk about this because the politics of Assam is 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 a is, is a very long and complicated story. But uh, I'll just mention this one vignette: the immigrants expulsion from is, is from Assam bill in 1950. Um, this was actually initially called the Undesirable Immigrants Expulsion from Assam Bill. The name was after very, very complicated debate in the uh, provisional parliament. This this came this was enacted two weeks after the constitution came into force. Uh, Change to Immigrants Expulsion from Assam. Now, section two of this, which is what I'm quoting over here, says that the central government has, and we'll see, has a lot of untrammeled power over here to order expulsion of certain immigrants. Any person or class of persons having been ordinarily resident in any place outside India, whether before or after the commencement of the act, have come into Assam and the stay of such persons is detrimental to the general interest of the public of India. The central government will order their removal and will give some such further direction in regard to their removal as it may consider necessary. Right? Again, this is to do with migrants. The proviso very specifically says that this is not applicable for uh, uh, refugees. So provided nothing in this section shall apply to any person who on account of civil disturbances or the fear of such disturbances in any area now forming part of Pakistan has been displaced from or has left his place of residence and has been subsequently residing in Assam. Now, what I think what we should think about is how similar this language and, the, and how similar this particular provision is to the raison d'etre of the CAA. Um, now, um, when this was discussed in the provisional parliament, uh, again, the, the religious implications were very clear. Now, it was very clearly stated by everybody uh, who was talking about the bill that reference to outside of India was only construed as Pakistan and that to East Bengal. There were two lakh Nepali people who were working in tea gardens in Assam, but they, but but they were told that because they, in language and religion, are akin to our, old pe our own people, uh, and this would not apply to them. Now that's interesting because because while, while Bengali and Assamese are undoubtedly different languages, Bengali and uh, Assamese and Nepali are also different languages. So it's what what seems to be clear is that it's not a question of language; it is merely a question of religion. Now. This uh, had again emerged out of a similar fear as the return of migrants to uh, across the western border. And, and this will come out of this fear of Muslim migration in Assam that had preceded the partition of India through the 1940s. And the movement of lakhs of undesirable immigrants, as Sardar B.S. Man, again from West Punjab, now in the Indian parliament, said, who are likely to be a source of separatism with the old league mentality and outlook. Uh, they, and these people, uh, Muslim Bengalis, are viewed as coming with a careful and calculated intent to a country 
over which they have not the least claim after partition. So look at the language here. It's, it's saying very clearly that, that these people are coming with careful and calculated intent, probably fissiparious, to a country over which they have not the le least claim after partition. Now, again, all those who emigrated on account of civil disturbances or the fear of such disturbances are only to be construed as non-Muslims. Those who have no place in Pakistan and are thrown out mercilessly, which is, again, this, this trope of, of the violent Pakistani uh, populace against, the, against Hindus and Sikhs. Um, now, in conclusion, uh, before we kind of, sorry, before we discuss the, before we op I open this to questions, um, I'm just going to look, I'm just going to uh, summarize what the main arguments of both the pieces that we talked about and that I've referred to in this discussion uh, were, that the initial definition, and, and I'm going to throw this open to questions and discussion after this, that the initial definition of citizenship according to Nijay Gopal, has actually been used so lie, with domicile and descent complementing rather than undermining citizenship based on birth. But that has changed over time to become, to take more elements of use and business. Joya Chatterjee actually looks at a broader picture, looks at the idea of the South Asian diaspora and says that not only did India and Pakistan move away from use so lie, they also moved away from conventional use sanguinous. To, pre to prevent undesirables who form part of the diaspora to return to India. Um, what I actually think is significant over here is the idea that is, is not, is, is in addition to both these, which are both compelling in their own ways, is the idea that, the, that, there, has, that there hasn't been a movement towards use sanguinous as such, but that but there's always been this underlying current. And, and, and so I wanted to think about what this means in the context of citizenship in India and what this means in the context of the constitutional guarantees of equal citizenship and secularism. Right, so um, with this, I'll end my presentation and I'll throw this open to discussion of questions. Am I still sharing my screen? Okay. Wonderful. Thank, thanks so much, Manu. So, so let's uh, open it up for, for questions, uh, comments as well, or if anybody wants to add anything more to what Manav said. So we'll, we'll keep it quite open-ended. Um, obviously, it was a very rich uh, and layered presentation. Uh, and even though Manav did not explicitly draw, always draw, linkages with the contemporary, I think uh, all of us can can see many continuities uh, in, in the CAA debate. And for us to uh, start thinking in a more nuanced manner about uh, the norms and practice of citizenship in India. So should we uh, take a round of questions? I have a list of thoughts and questions um, that I can come in and I'm sure Ashish does too, but we can come in after others have spoken. Um, may I just request people to raise their hands or yellow palms as we do in uh, Microsoft Teams. So while we are waiting for, oh great, we have, we have questions. So let's start with Pritha and then Sitam Sini. Yeah, Pritha, please go ahead. So this is not as much a question as it is just a thought. Um, I was really fascinated by the concept of volition that Section 7, uh, that Article 7 is uh, surrounded by, you know, uh, whether the, the Indian Muslims deliberately uh, migrated to Pakistan or whether there was, uh, you know, whether they were compelled to because of the violence. And I think it's interesting because it needs to be taken into account that Hindus coming into India from Pakistan might not have done so voluntarily, uh, but because of violence there. And I read accounts of Pakistani Hindus who had to migrate to India saying that uh, they did not want to, but they were forced to. Uh, 
they wanted to stay back in Pakistan. On the other hand, we have uh, Muslims who had migrated to Pakistan because of, um, say, violence and persecution. Uh, they still wanted to return to India. And they did that out of choice. Whatever the reason may have been, it may be financial considerations, maybe nostalgia, property, maybe they had a genuine affection for uh, for the land, but they, they wanted to con come back. They wanted it. Uh, and there is, I think, enough evidence to uh, show that most migrants on both sides believed genuinely that their resettlement was only temporary and they would return one day to their homes. I mean, of course, that almost never happened for almost all of them. But I think this is where the concept of deliberate migration or deliberately choosing a country comes in. And like the, co the concept of volition really becomes very complicated. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you, Pritha. Uh, Sitamsini? Um, yes, it's sort of a question I wanted you to expand a bit more. Like you had just made a brief comment on when there were refugees that came in after the initial partition, they were not refugees in the sense that they were stateless because they did have a stake in citizenship of whichever country they went to. So maybe to expand on that, because, you know, we see that keep, it keeps coming up, like what uh, the division between a refugee and a migrant, a refugee and a unwanted migrant and a refugee who is not stateless, but almost like a citizen who has a stake in citizenship. So maybe um, a little bit common, more comments on that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hello. Hi. Thanks. Uh, Manav, do you want to respond to the question and the comment? Uh, and I would request the others to also stack up their uh, comments and questions in the meantime. So I will actually, I'll first respond to Sitam Sitam Sini. Is that the name? Hi, Sitam Sini. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So, um, yeah, so this refugee, uh, like, I think what I wanted to point out over here was that the idea of a refugee in 19 in nine in 1947 South Asia and until the 50s actually was not someone was was actually someone who was coming as a in search of refuge so uh, so it's interesting because the Hindi word for a refugee was Sharanarthi who was coming in search of refuge the Urdu word was the same Panahgir someone coming for Panah the Bangla word again was either Shalonathi or uh, Udbastu. Udbastu means somebody who's been uprooted or who's lost their house. But what's but the interesting thing is that at no point did those who migrated first think of themselves as people who were not who were stateless and they were not treated as such. So for example, when when Muslims came reached India, when, when Muslims reached Pakistan from India or when Hindus and Sikhs reached India from Pakistan, they were viewed as citizens. They were viewed as proto-citizens. And on the other hand, they were actually viewed as people who were the, the first citizens because of how much they suffered. So, and, and this happens in Pakistan when there are questions around Muhajir politics in the late 40s and early 50s. So there's, there's tension between the Sindh government and the, and, the, and the Pakistani government. And the Pakistani government goes all out for the refugees, it says that these are muhajids. These are people who have actually even even the word muhajir actually has like has a link with the uh, with the prophet's migration. So it's so there was this whole kind of genealogy of migration that was constructed. Um, so what I'm basically saying is is that at no uh, is that these were not people who were seen as stateless. The refugee migrant distinction was was again. And this ties up to Krita's question was viewed as something that was that that was about who was moving in and who was moving out and why they were moving in and out. Uh, so that's that's I think my answer to you, Sitam Sini. To Krita, thank you for that point because it's because again uh, I think what we must remember is and and keep reminding ourselves because it's 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 something that that needs to keep being thought about is that partition migration was very complicated. And uh, in many cases, people say that they have wanted to stay back, uh, but 
again, the whole question of whether they actually did want to stay back or not is complicated. There was, of course, on, in Punjab, there's cataclysmic violence. And in Punjab, there was no question of people being allowed to stay back. The governments were pushing for uh, migration. It is only in very, very rare circumstances that people stayed back. Uh, in the late 40s, there were very few Hindus and Sikhs who went back to Pakistan. There was this thing that the, Pakistan, that the Punjab government launched called the Phir Basau Andolan. And they used the word Andolan to appeal to, you know, like Hindus and Sikhs, uh, which is kind of strange. But uh, and so like some some industrialists came back, they stayed in places like Sialkot and Lahore. But uh, but mostly what happened in Punjab was that migration was was permanent. Once people left, they never went back. Uh, on the other hand, when we move away from the Punjab story, we see a more interesting and more nuanced uh, pattern emerging. So, for example, in Sindh, people came to India. A lot of Sindhi Hindus came to India in late 1947 and early 1948, uh, went back to Pakistan in 1949. In Bengal, people were moving, were, were moving to uh, you know, like to and through the border throughout the 50s, uh, and like had and had kind of like hedged their risks by by owning property in both India and East Pakistan, so that you know they could move wherever they wanted to. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that also for the most part, apart from the apart from a set of elite uh, Muslim League politicians. The vast majority of Muslim movement to Pakistan occurred because either because of violence or because of, of and, and this is true for Hindus in East Bengal as well, that there was this this kind of zone where there wasn't like violence in terms of the possibility of, of death, but there was a general drying up of opportunity. There was, you know, like, I mean, if you watch this film called Galam Hawa, there's, there's a beautiful part where uh, Baldad Sani, who plays a uh, Muslim shoe factory owner goes to a goes to a bank and just doesn't get loans. This was very true. This was very true. Uh, the uh, the loans that were given to Muslims between 1947 to 48 were uh, 240% of the loans that were given to Muslims between 1950 and 1951. So there was also a sense of of low grade violence. You know, like there were there were things that the Urdu Urdu went away from schools. Uh, Likewise, in, in East Bengal, the, the very fact that, you know, they stopped stuff like Saraswati Puja in schools became a, a, reason, a, re, a reason for people to, to think about moving because the, 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 the Bengal they knew or the, the town they knew had changed. So I, I think this, but what, what was interesting was that in constituent assembly debates and in the popular imagination, even now, the idea of Muslims moving to Pakistan was seen as a conscious choice. It wasn't. In Delhi, in, in Delhi, it wasn't. In, in Western UP, it wasn't. It was a response to, to insane amounts of violence. Throughout the 50s, people, as, as, they, as opportunities dried up in India, facing real or perceived discrimination, moved to Pakistan. Uh, the same pattern happened with Sindhi Hindus and East Bengali Hindus. And often, and in some cases, there was there was also a movement uh, back and forth. So I think that that this that, that that we should really interrogate the idea of what it means to assume a voluntary migration, and what we and what we how do I say uh, what we perpetuate when we when we think about migration as voluntary. Or like interrogate what my what the interrogate why people might move. Okay, so Thanks. any follow up to that, or should we then move yeah. to? Okay. No, I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, we have another question or comment from Devanshi. Um, Devanshi, please go ahead. Followed by Kush. Firstly, thank you so much for the presentation, Professor. It was really insightful. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think I have a few um, clarifications to ask and uh, then a sort of idea that is stuck with me and I really want to run by you and get a sort of better understanding of. So um, 
to begin with, the clarification that I have is uh, while we while you were explaining the permit system, uh, there were three things that you had broken it down to, and uh, one of them being a nationalist Muslim. So um, I I think I didn't understand what that would characterize as, especially in the context where we had a little discussion uh, where you you mentioned about the constitutional assembly discussions around uh, a state's uh, or India's perceived responsibility. And uh, that itself was very skewed and limited to Pakistani Hindus and Sikhs. So um, I think the reading used this uh, sort of this term called bureaucratic rationalization, I think. And uh, they said that it is that they don't want to overburden the system of governance or because refugees are overburdening the governance system. I wanted to know that whether like it was a very easy route to say that they have limited their perceived responsibility and that that needed like a very underlying way for India to come ahead with a very stringent permit system to begin with because they refused or put up their hands saying that that is all that they are responsible for. And that's why some bits of the permit system seemed very not just stringent but arbitrary to me. So that is of the first thing that I wanted to ask. And uh, secondly, on the lines of domicile, um, I am speaking from a very uh, naive perspective of how domicile is used currently or the sort of advantages attached to it or how if you are from a particular college where you are domiciled, you have these incentives. So I want to understand whether the transition of conceptualizing domicile now had anything to do with the, the sort of attachment with citizenship, the sort of anything with previous encounters with domicile to begin with. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Devan uh, Devanshi. Uh, Kush, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, first of all, once again, thank you for, for joining us and um, speaking to us about these aspects of citizenship. Um, I have I have tried to sort of formulate them into questions, but uh, seeing that seeing that I can't really pose a question that is uh, going to get like a very um, detailed answer, I'm trying to address these as comments. Now, particularly in terms of what we've seen in both the readings of Joel uh, Abdi and Nirja Gopal Jayal is essentially that even in these ideas or narratives of migration, there is some sense of able-bodiedness that is presumed in the sense that the ability to cross borders and sort of move from one place to another is sort of capable for certain certain people, but not for all. And I guess uh, Manko's short story on Tom and Dick Singh is also a very important aspect of it in the sense that certain people who are institutionalized are not immediately thought of as people who need to be exchanged and whose citizenship is even in question and what needs to be done about that. So they're not the first sort of subjects or equally considered on, on some footing about how their sort of repatriation has to take place. Um, I'm also thinking about um, the idea of breaks and continuities as Professor Mosin sort of hinted towards and how um, India's policy of, of uh, tolerance for refugees as like a, a, it's sort of relevant in uh, the post partition era because um, we know that they didn't sign the 1951 convention on refugees but they've always so up until like a certain point of time in recent years they've claimed that they've been very open and welcoming to refugees even uh, even sort of um, drawing its authority from charismatic sources such as Swami Vivekananda's address uh, at the, the World Congress. So these are all aspects that sort of come into play because the refugee policy question is also something that needs to be sort of checked with empirical data and whether there was any sort of bias in terms of which refugees were granted asylum in India, whether uh, considerations such as religion factor into these decisions. So these are the for, these are the few thoughts that sort of struck me from your talk. Thank you so much once again. Thanks. Thanks, Kush. Uh, Manu, you want to respond to the two questions or comments? Okay. Yeah. So um, let's. Uh, okay. I'll I'll start responding to Devanchis and like you can uh, interrupt me and uh, ask me if I'm 
getting the question right. Um, so your first question was about permits and the idea of nationalist Muslims, right? So who were these? I mean, so this the, the term actually was something I, I, I quoted directly from what Nehru had said. Now, nationalist Muslims in, in, in the context of what he was saying were two sets of people. One of them were people who were ordinarily domiciled in India, but had because of violence had to leave. And this is also true because in late 1947, the very fact of your being Muslim meant that you were in danger in certain situations. So there were a lot of Indian uh, of, of Congress politicians uh, living in India whose families had moved to Pakistan and who had to move. So it is in in that context that that especially in the Punjab they were referred to as nationalist Muslims. The other set of people were those who had actually uh, been, again, like been associated with the Congress and with the Indian freedom struggle. And because of that, found their, uh, their uh, life in Pakistan deeply uh, compromised, as it were. So uh, one of the people who were supposed to be, were actually talked about very specifically in the context of this, even by Shamprasad Mukherjee, of all people, was um, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan as, 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 the, as the quintessential nationalist Muslim. Uh, so, so that's when, so the whole idea was that, that, so basically what I'm trying to say is that when the permit system was introduced, the, the permit for resettlement was given only to a set of people who were deemed to be beyond reproach in any way. So when that permit was to be given, there was a full CID investigation. Your family's antecedents were seen. Uh, I mean, like the reasons for the cancelling, uh, reasons for not giving people permits to come back, or actually even to declare them intending evacuees and take, take over their property was the fact that, oh, his cousin was an important Muslim leaguer. Now that meant very little in the late 1940s because there were, there were situations where Families were split down the middle on in, in terms of politics. Uh, there, there's one really interesting case called Nizar Ahmad versus the government of Jodhpur, which um, which is which is really fun because uh, this is a man who gets stuck in Pakistan for three years and tries to come back. He has effectively gone on the 11th of July 1948 to Pakistan with uh, 500 bottles of scotch. Uh, which he has to deliver to politicians in Karachi because uh, Pakistan is at that point of time starting a very brief and short-lived experiment with prohibition. Uh, he gets stuck in Pakistan because of the because of this uh, uh, because of the permit system being introduced without any uh, knowledge, and uh, he then is only able to come back by getting a temporary permit. He tries to have that temporary permit changed into a permanent permit, but because his cousin, who is living in India and, and has never moved, is considered has had Muslim League uh, allegiances in the past, he is uh, he's not given uh, a permit to resettle. The cousin, of course, because he's never left, is is continuing to live in Jodhpur, but this man who has who actually had no political inclinations that we can find apart from a pension for whiskey. Uh, is is prevented from uh, uh, coming back to India. Mm. Now, uh, okay, yeah, so, and, and also this whole idea of bureaucratic rationalization also happens because I, I think um, now with people coming back, there's also uh, the two or three things that are happening at the same time. One is that the Indian government uh, feels like it has, because it has, because it has taken a secular position, it cannot explicitly go back on it. Now, as we have seen through in, in both the ways in which these provisions are drafted, in ways in which these are operationalized, and in ways when the judiciary that the judiciary responds to them, there is there is definitely a, a religious bias that is coming in. But the government feels like it is it is incumbent upon them not to uh, actually take uh, this uh, take take a, an explicitly uh, an explicit position against other against Islam. Uh, secondly, the thing the, the thing that we also must remember is that until 1971, the percentage of Hindus in Pakistan was more than the percentage of Muslims in India because you had the East. 
so there was this whole idea of how if if we were to take a very strong position against against muslims coming back to india even on the western frontier what repercussions that would have on hindus in the east many of whom were zamindars were owners of lots of property had um, large uh, lands were uh, industrialists in small ways and and owners of banks and uh, lots of uh, and, and teachers and, and all of that so i mean the the hindu uh, caste hindus of course were uh, an elite uh, part of east bengal society and continue to be even now to a lesser extent so that's uh, um okay with regard to domicile the interesting thing is that uh, i mean domicile doesn't have the same uh, connection i think that it has now with in terms of um, in terms of your um, you know like reservation of seats and stuff like that but domicile becomes particularly significant in the context of women and children because women and children take on the domicile of the father now this actually meant that there have been that there were many cases i think about thousands of cases i mean only a few went up to court but uh, like government files have these plenty of letters from women in urdu punjabi bangla all of whom have had husbands who have moved to or fathers who have moved to pakistan have been stuck by the permit system therefore the husbands have become pakistani citizens therefore these women have also become pakistani citizens even though even though many of them write these printed notes saying you know hum badda nashin hai hum hum ghar se bahar bhi nahi nikle hai we are badda nashin women we've never even left our houses but they become pakistani citizens and their property gets taken over be under the evacuee property norms and and they, and they literally have to leave a house they have they have never left since they've gotten married uh so that that's the way in which domicile kind of functioned at the time with regard to married women um kush um yeah so actually i find this is a very interesting uh, question you asked and i i must confess i haven't really thought about it i've read to what texting of course but uh the the able bodied uh, dimension of migration the very fact that to move you had to be able bodied is something that uh there has not really been much work on and this is a very fascinating aspect of the question i mean there were of course uh, you had uh, at least in punjab you had uh, ambulances and uh, you know like there was an exchange of populations from hospitals and tb hospitals and even and and in fact even the tour taking story is interesting because in the archives you see th- this constant question about about people in prison and in mental asylums having to be exchanged because uh, because there is nobody to look after them outside and so both countries take a kind of uh, i mean the the tour taking seems to i mean manto seems to suggest in tour taking that it wasn't thought about before 1951 but but this was something that is exercising the minds of of uh, both governments and both governments until 1951 were like you know given that we don't know where the families are we feel uh, we feel like we can take care of them in any case these are people these are not people who own who own or are capable of owning property so like property kind of figures in in that uh, story as well uh, but of course with other with other forms of physical disability uh, uh, that wouldn't be the case um with regard to india's uh, general position on refugees i am a little i'm a little iffy on this because uh, you know like while india is supposed to be very welcoming and has of course historically had its moments of being welcoming to to uh, a set of refugees from a variety of places uh, in many cases that has had uh, like it has not been entirely self uninterested let's just say there has at least in the context of tibet or in the context of east pakistan there was a very uh, important political uh, aspect to it um on the whole uh, and and i think in a paper that i've written about this actually my argument is for a gender is for the religion neutral refugee law perhaps with quotas i as being a much better alternative to the to the travesty that the caa is but i i feel like india's uh, reputation with regard to refugees has been 
uh, carefully um, built up as a self interest as, as, as a completely self uninterested thing i don't think it's necessarily as self uninterested as all that um thank thanks manav um so i can't see any more hands but i would request people to raise your hands so can i be opportunistic enough to uh, ask a couple of questions uh, of my own as in i have a, i have a list of questions but i thought i'll maybe ask two and then oh, somajit has raised his hand so maybe after me somajit can step in and if uh, we still have time um then maybe i'll ask the other two so the first question i had was manav that i think you've done as you one of the most striking features of your presentation which also obviously is reflected uh in the larger scholarship but you've sharpened it for us is how since uh or even during the framing of the constitution how policy makers have framed exclusionary provisions both in the constitution and what i would call constitutional administrative law of citizenship uh you know if i property acts and uh, official discretion um and framing them as facially neutral while constructing a certain understanding of belonging so who belongs who's a refugee who's not who's a migrant who's an illegal migrant and who's more acceptable person but apart from constructing a notion of belonging uh there is also construction of the notion of victimhood and that i think comes across very strongly when in in the current ca debate which is also reflected in say for example your discussion of the expulsions act uh people displaced by civil disturbance or persecuted minority uh how would you uh, look at how the notion of victimhood or victimization itself is constructed uh, over a period of time uh, what do our laws see and what do our laws hide when it comes to victim i am also very keen to hear from you because i think this connects with the last thing which you just mentioned which is the question of refugees what kind of suffering uh do we see do we not see through our laws and how is this notion of victimhood uh, how has it evolved over time the second question maybe i'll ask is um if you could throw some more light on the debates around uh a models of citizenship either you solai or you sangini um not only in the context of partition but how the constitutional framers and subsequently the policy makers thought of citizenship and belonging outside the debates of partition so for example i remember the debates around indian africans uh indian descent in south africa and in other uganda and other places uh, requesting that they should be given some form of citizenship and how did uh, that notion uh, get debated in the early years of the republic and how has that eventually changed shape towards overseas indian citizenship or even the understanding that india in some sort of compelling way is the is a country of return to a large number of hindus across the world which is often the paddle which is made with ca um so how how did they debate uh how did they debate indianness nationality in an ethnic sort of sense and citizenship outside the contours of the partition debate um i would also like to ask a question it's more of clarification though but you would mention man of that uh, uh in a lot of these cases it was perhaps not conceptualized as religious persecution which was the reason behind the move it was rather just external violence which was happening more or less because of religion right but was it ever that maybe in the news or in politics or in law that the word religious persecution appeared or uh, or what were the other terms which were associated with the move how did how did the public discourse back then uh, conceptualize this this reason that would be all from me thank you okay i think somaji could perhaps add this question now should, should we get manas just from because we already asked three and uh, my be heavy and then we can obviously come to some of it sorry some of you okay i'll i'll start with uh, ashish's question actually so um yeah it's interesting because when uh, you know like when this whole question is being debated uh, the whole idea is i mean the, the whole idea is of course of a form of religious persecution 
but the but the trope that is often used is the idea of women so the idea that our women folk are not safe there is something that 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 you see happening in sin that that you see discussions about in bengal all the time and and that becomes a kind of blanket uh thing for the lot of things i mean like this this takes the form of the fact that uh i mean like women are like there are muslim men who look at women in a different way for instance so that that's what they say in testimonies when they're coming in the early in 1950 particularly after just before the the akhat nehru pact so they say you know our women are looked at differently they 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 follow them they they watch them have a bath when they go to the temple and when they have the ritual bath after going to a temple there there are men and women who snigger around them uh the idea of them being picked up so uh this whole concept i mean the the main way in which this kind of one, one major way is the idea of religious of of women being targeted the other the other thing is the the question of religious spaces that were technically outside the evacuee property act being taken over so there's this whole thing about you know gurdwaras being taken over or temples in east bengal being taken over and there are these cases where you know people where where the government uh, because they have these minority boards so there there's this there's correspondence that says no actually that isn't a temple it's just a house and that house had a room where they had a where they had a puja ghar and that's where the, and then so this whole so th- these were the two major things that uh, that are the that that are talked about uh that there isn't enough a respect particularly to women so the bangla term that they used is, uh, that they use is mojada which is like the the hindi maryada and uh, and the idea that uh, that religious uh, through sessions and religious ceremonies are are no longer inviolate um so that's one i mean otherwise when there there's also other stuff about how uh in schools for instance uh, texts change promotions don't happen particularly in east bengal so like a lot of teachers who are coming from there are saying that that even though they they have a ba degree people with an fa degree are being prioritized because they are muslim and and this is also coming from then this is also there's a history to this also in bengal because because there has been a set of uh, of there, there has been religious reservation in bengal from 1937 onwards but that that kind of gets accentuated um there's also the the idea of in some cases people also say that because of the separate electorates we we feel like we will never get to vote in in our districts so yeah so that um mohsen um uh, yeah your questions as always are uh make one think very much um so uh yeah i mean so so the whole idea of victimhood and how it has changed i think kind of links in some ways to my response to ashish which is the idea of how uh, of of this this notion of how that how non muslims are perpetually consigned to second to second rate citizenship through the subcontinent Uh, Afghanistan's a bit of an outlier, and I think that's also because of like the the Taliban and general, um, you know, instability over there. But the idea that uh, that minorities in the subcontinent, as opposed to India, are, are constantly uh, sidelined. Uh, the objective re- resolution became a, a major issue, and I think that that's so. Like the whole discussion around Pakistan being a state created for Muslims. um kind of got accentuated in popular discourse in both india and pakistan after the objectives resolution and i think that's that's been the the trope since then um in both pakistan and to a lesser extent bangladesh um yeah and um now uh with regard to your question about the models of citizenship other than uh especially so now, can i just say something on that before you move on so as in so basically the the reason why i had asked this question was because in the ca debate there is this rather peculiar uh, 
set of conversations about how do we end up defining persecuted minorities. Now, this notion of persecuted minorities is not only in CA, sort of, mm. but is, you know, CA itself makes a reference, 2019 makes itself a reference to the uh, different orders uh, under the Foreigners Act and the Passport Act where um, uh, you know persecuted minorities from pakistan afghanistan bangladesh over a period of time have been included now the big in under the administrative law regime uh under the passport act and foreigners act uh, the people who obviously they are not getting citizenship under those regimes but they are getting some sort of exemption or immunity from prosecution under these two acts and they basically have to submit some sort of like a form an affidavit uh, it's a standard, non-demanding evidentiary procedure. But they're still being called persecuted minorities. Hmm. And that is what CAA takes up, that they are persecuted minorities. So one of the debates that came up was, well, the people who were critical of CAA, they were like, well, how will you prove that you're persecuted? And I felt that the BJP, for very obvious reasons, particularly Amit Shah, was very torn. He was torn because... For Assam, he wanted to say that the evidentiary standard would be really demanding. Mm. Because people in Assam don't want Hindus or anybody else also to come in, by and large. Well, that's the rhetoric. And outside Assam, people, presumably, at least BJP's uh, constituents, would want a lower threshold of persecution. Uh, in fact, I feel that they would say that the mere fact that somebody is, say, for example, a Hindu in Bangladesh or Pakistan or Afghanistan is by itself a state of persecution. Uh, at least that's the assumption. So my curiosity was not only this political legal dilemma of uh, the government in trying to juggle these two, but also the need to frame it in terms of persecution. And why do they need to frame it as, as, as a matter of persecution? Is it because there's a larger historical trajectory in which these things have to be facially neutral? And persecution is something which sort of somehow manages to frame it in a, yeah. in a facially neutral term and therefore can pass off as secular, rightly or wrongly. But also, maybe it's, maybe it's also because there's a genuine feeling that the mere fact that, as you said, somebody is a Hindu in Bangladesh or a Hindu in Pakistan is a state of persecution, is a state of victimhood, which therefore is not comparable. And I think that may be a deep-seated feeling which may require more thinking because if it is then the whole debate about whether evidence should be given or not is really a red herring because that is really not about proof because the fact that somebody is of an inferior status in, in Pakistan is not as a matter of proof but that is as a matter of conceptual historical necessity um, I guess you've sort of answered that uh, I think you, you're saying exactly that but yeah I just wanted to say this and in case you wanted to add something to your response yeah, I think that's actually that that's true because I feel like I feel like this notion of the the non-Muslim in both pa in in well Pakistan and then Pakistan and Bangladesh as being axiomatically, so to speak, discriminated against, is something that has been unquestioningly accepted in Indian um, well in in like Indian lawmaking around migrants coming from. East Pakistan and well, even West Pakistan in forty-seven since nineteen forty-seven. So I think that, that that has the the interesting thing is that I think in the seventies and eighties, the fact that Bangladesh was created kind of put that argument on the back foot because then there was this whole sense of of Bengali nationalism and then of course there was closeness with the Indian government that lasted until nineteen seventy-five and stuff like that. But I think. For the most part, you can see this continuing from 1947 that, that you don't really, that the assumption is that because you're Hindu in Pakistan, you are discriminated against. Um, and, and, and I think that the, the, need to, the need to mention that is, I think, kind of, so I think what the CA is doing is two things. It's, it's mentioning these religious categories. So it's it's very clearly excluding excluding Ahmadis and excluding Rohingyas from the ambit because it's it's both geographically and uh, religi and religiously bounded. But by this by, by by still saying that there is a need to at least primarily assert a persecution 
and of course like persecution is also something that can't be the, can't really be proved right you can't i mean if if you take the 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 women example that i was giving in east bengal there's nobody who can say that that didn't happen but i think that's that's um, that is still that little uh, like there they need to use a criteria criterion other than religion simplicity to discriminate so maybe that that's why the but i think that the the as of that that there has never been a real questioning that people in pakistan are not uh, persecuted i mean even even the the left through the 50s and 60s has i mean it has argued that people can people should find ways in pakistan of dealing with this but not but they haven't really disputed the factum of oppression or persecution so so that um yeah uh uh your ha uh, your other question uh on so i think that there's a very interesting thing that happens post 1948 49 and i'm not sure it's so a joy strategy seems to think it's because of partition that that both countries kind of move away from a from a youth sang- sanguinist conception of citizenship because she's wanted the people uh, that undesirables will come back that that's certainly a part of the story but i don't think that's all of it i think it's also the fact that uh when that as that that because of the upheavals of the 1940s across the world you know in 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 places like burma in ceylon in africa um there is this sense of um a large number of people who are dealing with newer uh stronger governments that are kind of that are again um coming up with uh laws that discriminate against indians or kind of remove them from the privileged position they've had uh and and there but there is also a simultaneous recognition of the fact that 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 india can only afford to do can 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 do very little substantively so there's this whole idea of sanctions against south africa or sanctions against burma in the early 50s and their concerns about uh, and and there is uh, so i i read these in the context of 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 uh, conversations with the sri lankan the selenese prime minister kotila wala and nehru and and they're like bitter letters that that uh, that go uh, that that go back and forth between them about the about the responsibility of uh, of indian tamils but the indian position is very clear that uh, that that they have lived in ceylon and therefore they they, they reserve selenese nationality and, and india will will back that struggle but will not take any responsibility for that and that's true for i think that that changes a little with burma and in the context of pacts that are the sirima shastri pact in 1965 but on the whole uh, india kind of uh, takes a very different position from the position it has taken during and before the second world war on minority rights and on, on indians as minorities in other uh, countries so great thank you manal that's really helpful uh samaji uh and then we'll take uh, maybe a last question after samaji and in case anybody has uh, any other thing to add you're most welcome to yes yeah, samaji please go ahead. thank you for the detailed presentation sir and uh, like my first question would be like i have three parts of questions so my first question would be that in uh, neerja gopal jayal's article it's like in the book it stated that uh, the initially it was concept conceptualized that the principle of just solai just solai would be like expanded in a way in the in, in the report of motilal nehru committee but it was stated you know like people who had traveled to india and suddenly conceived and a child was born who, whose birth t- took place in india would be by by virtue of his birth in india would deemed to be a resident of, or like a citizen of india like mm-hmm. what was the debates antecedent to that like or precedent after after this committee report that the entire debate shifted to an extent where it was solely limited to you know the provincial basis like domicile basis uh my second question would be in terms of evacuee property like in uh, 19 around uh, 
early 1948 like there was this ordinance which was brought in in india in east uh, in east punjab especially where i feel like it was stated it was envisioned to an extent where you know a person like the scope of a person uh, to be defined as an evacuee was extended to a large extent like the yeah. act would have like declared any person who was a resident of indian state and like departed just because of communal tensions the word communal tension is very important here and if he departed because of some communal tensions or disturbances in the year 1947 like then the government could like just state him as an evacuee and also like there was a uh, there was a time at which like it was discussed of creating a separate category of intending evacuees like the government like asked the state governments the central government didn't take this decision but they actually asked the uh, like state governments to add this provision also uh, on the same lines i would just like to ask another question uh, when the category of permit raj was supposed to be implemented at that particular point of time before its implementation pandit nehru and uh, sardar vallabhbhai patel had a series of letters which were extended like exchanged between both of them sardar vallabhbhai patel in those letters had very like uh, expressed his concerns in regards to communal tensions that could take place in the country just merely because of the uh, arrival of muslim uh, muslim personals from pakistan and after when we see that a lot of problematic texts are being used when it is being referred like when sardar vallabhbhai patel refers to the pakis like muslims who are coming from uh, pakistan and then nehru actually tells him that okay we can try to create something some framework if you could just elaborate on this okay okay so let's uh, start with uh, the last question first so basically what had happened was was that there were there were two or three things that were uh that were uh being discussed just before the permit system was introduced the first thing was the idea that when people come back from pakistan uh regardless of their political inclinations or regardless of their links with the league or, or not the very fact that they were coming back and trying to take over property that was already given to muslims uh, given to non muslims even though they continue to be the owners of that property was likely to result in tension now this was happening in the context of places like delhi particularly because delhi had a very interesting thing that had happened to it in the months after partition so in september 1947 from september 1947 the delhi government actually came up with a set of places called muslim zones in the walled city and around this was after terrible violence in uh, hitherto muslim suburbs like sabzi mandi and uh, um, karol bagh which had resulted in the decimation of the muslim population they all moved to the purana killer camps or been killed or had flown to pakistan so at that point of time what had happened was was that this was that they came up with the idea of muslim zones as being areas where refugees could not settle now this aroused a great deal of ire and because of that these muslim zones were constantly whittled down so effectively these muslim from being places where refugees could not enter they became muslim ghettos and they continued and, and these areas continue to have a large like even in delhi now they they like areas that were designated as muslim zones which did not necessarily have a muslim majority before partition are now largely muslim um and so um so so that had that was so the idea of the very fact of people coming back as being as being something that would result in tensions with a set of refugees who felt like they weren't being taken seriously enough and their concerns were were being uh, marginalized was was a problem the second thing of course was that patel uh, and this was also when both the kashmir and hyderabad the issues were flaring up so patel was very worried about people coming back and uh, and and raising the bugaboo of these issues so so nehru was uh, constantly pushing back and so the permit was um, in a way for nehru a kind of compromise to allow at least some people to come back on the western border um the second question that you had about the evacuee property ordinance 
so evacuee property actually because of those two because it was between those two it was it was kind of dealing with those two competing um, imperatives of of safeguarding property while settling people actually had uh, had various uh, like took on various forms very quickly so uh, by the winter of 1947 actually in punjab and bombay so initially it was seen as a, as a, as a punjab problem then the the scope of the evacuee property laws was constantly extended and finally in 1948 the central government decided to start making laws on it so um, one of the drafts and one of the ordinances actually basically considered anybody an evacuee if he had left the uh, or she had left the place that they were ordinarily resident in so the very fact that you know you move from let's say your house in pahadganj to a refugee camp in the purana kila even though you wanted to come back to your house meant that the property could be taken over as uh, evacuee property um with regard to intending evacuees actually the interesting thing is that neeraj gopal jail gets it wrong uh the intending evacuee was actually introduced it wasn't i mean she says it was suggested but it didn't really happen it did and what an intending evacuee what happened with an intending evacuee was that his property wasn't taken over but the intending evacuee's ability to alienate the property either by renting or selling was curtailed without express permission from the custodian so effectively the intending evacuee could not use his property at all and that became a reason and that became a way of pushing people into uh into uh, to go to pakistan and then taking over the property uh the other thing they did was there was this there was this law called the separation of interests act which basically meant that that if let's say in a family one brother had gone to pakistan one fourth of that property and there were four brothers one fourth of that property became evacuee property now that makes no sense because in in a joint house you can't really divide a house so what that meant was that refugees were allowed to settle in a part of the house the very fact that refugees came into the house then pushed out the rest of the family so they either took either, either took residence somewhere else or often moved to pakistan um yeah so that's the uh second part the first question um so i'm actually uh so i mean this whole idea of why, why domicile uh, why the the why usolai in in its most expansive form wasn't really adopted was also partly because i i think there were when this started to be discussed there were questions about how there should be some element of belonging or desire to be an indian citizen so i mean there's this one uh joy chatterjee's article actually talks about sardar patel actually um brings up a, or rajendra prasad mahan then brings up a question about you know what happens if a jap quote and quote has a child in india and uh, doesn't want to settle but does the jap kid get citizenship or not and uh, and that i think was was uh, seen as pushing it too far but then i i think that even by the, by early 1947 there had been this sense of of how a completely uh, a completely useful i think with no regard to to family would not work in india so i think that that's uh, um yeah so that's i think my answer to three questions you put up uh do you want clarification or uh any more information on any of that or oh, if you want to disagree Oh, ah, definitely. Uh, I think that was quite uh, comprehensive. Thank you so much, Manu. Um, great. So we are right at the end of our session. I think we have uh, extended Manu's welcome. Really, we have like must have exhausted uh, him. So thank you so much for your time, Manu. Uh, always a pleasure to to talk, and obviously a great. Uh, privilege for all of us to hear your thoughts on on these issues this is your area of uh, great expertise and we hope to read uh, much more uh, of the stuff written by you on these matters and obviously on other matters as well uh, so from on behalf of all of us ashish and i would like to thank you for your time
and I'll obviously talk to you and thank you also later separately. So yeah, so this is the collective gratitude. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, happy birthday once again. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, so should we just close the session because it's almost time and then we can communicate over the email uh, to the rest of the class. I mean. Ashish, what do you think? Yeah, that would be perfect. I mean, it's just barely five minutes left. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you so much. much. I'll see the rest of you on Friday then. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Manav. Bye. Thank you. So can I say one thing though? The odd thing about these um, MS Teams sessions is that there's very little closure at the end of the session. <laughs> it's abrupt because when you know you, in physical classes you end the end your session, then people walk up to the speaker, they thank them, and you get to say an extended goodbye, which is outside so this normal setting. But open in chai. or Zoom, sorry, I said open with chai. Oh, exactly, there's some chai, there's some biscuits, there's something, or if, you know, if uh, Jindal is uh, particularly uh, generous, then we can have that three-piece sort of snack with like a samosa and a sandwich also, etc. I can't, I can't believe I'm being all sort of nostalgic about <laughs> the Jindal samosa. Adexo. I just didn't record it, so thank you so much, Adexo, for your help in case you're like, spying on us. But, uh, but because there's no sort of informal thank you socializing, it seems quite sort of rough and I fear that it gets sort of quite, um, there's no closure. So that's why I'm just being facile, making it sound as informal as possible. Thank you so much, Manav, again. I hope you have a closure of talking to us and all of us. Also. Okay. All right. See you guys in Saturday. Bye-bye.